everybody to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research webinar, Cannabis and Oncology, What Do We Know? My name is Amy Reese, and I'm the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Hirschberg Foundation. Aggie Hirschberg, our founder, is here too, and looks forward to saying hello at the end of the webinar. First, I'd like to acknowledge our wonderful sponsors who make these webinars possible, including Celgene, Novacure, and Fibrogen. Please ask your questions either during or after the slide presentation by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Noah Fetterman. We first met Dr. Fetterman in 2019 at the third annual UCLA Cannabis Research Symposium. After hearing his lecture on cannabis use in oncology, it was clear our pancreatic cancer community would benefit and appreciate hearing him speak as well. In addition to Dr. Fetterman's position as director of the Pediatric Bone and Soft Tissue Sarcoma Program at UCLA, he's a faculty member of the UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative one of the first academic programs in the world dedicated to the study of cannabis. Their mission is to advance scientific understanding of the impacts of cannabis and hemp on body, brain, mind, and society. In Dr. Fetterman's clinical oncology practice, he uses cannabis and cannabinoid compounds as adjunctive therapies and has a keen interest in how they can help patients. Thank you, Dr. Fetterman. It's my pleasure to turn the mic over to you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for uh, making time for this lecture today. Um, as, uh, as Amy had mentioned, um, I'm actually board certified as a pediatric oncologist. Um, so that may not pertain to many of you. Uh, but in fact, uh, most of my patients are adolescents and young adults. And what I'll be speaking about today in terms of cannabis and cannabinoids in oncology is really not specific necessarily to one cancer or another, but really to the field of cancer in general in, in adults and in children. Um, I, I want to say before I get started, a huge uh, thank you to Aggie Hirschberg, the Hirschberg Foundation, um, Amy for just staying on top of me because I get <laughs> busy and, um, and occasionally forgetful, but it just is, a, as I get older at UCLA, I, I have more hats here and um, the the pandemic and tragedy of COVID-19 has, has, uh, has put a new field of research and clinical um, care under my purview that um, I wasn't planning on, on taking care of. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my um, slides in one second here. Let's um, make sure that that works. And... Okay, can everybody see, can you guys see my slides now? Yes. Great. Okay, so um, I have a couple of disclosures uh, to make. Um, I am a speaker and scientific advisory board member to uh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, um, unrelated to this talk, but I think it's always important to disclose any business relationships, as well as an advisory board member to a company that does um, specialize in cannabis therapeutics called Zelda Therapeutics that's based in Australia. Actually, they changed their name recently to Zolera Therapeutics. Let me put my phone on mute, excuse me. Um, so the objectives for the talk today, we're going to do a very quick overview of cannabis and cannabinoid pharmacology. Um, we're going to talk about some history of cannabis in the oncology field, our landscape of use of cannabinoids in cancer patients, what the evidence is, both in the supportive care of cancer patients and also in direct applications as anti-cancer therapeutics. And then we're going to talk about also some of the potential toxicities that can be associated 
and some future um, applications uh, in oncology as well. This is really meant to be a, an overview and, and really I think this talk is going to raise a lot more questions that you may have than answers because this is a field that is, is growing in evidence um, and there's also been a lot of limitation how to study this the way that we would study, um, for example, uh, compounds going through the, the FDA. Um, what I will not be reviewing are, for example, specific, um, uh, specific cannabinoid compounds that are not FDA approved. Um, I will not be discussing uh, a lot about uh, roots of, of therapy, um, but it's, this is really meant to serve as a background for, um, you know, a lot of the other, the nitty gritty that, that I may not be the best person to talk about, uh, nor is there a lot of evidence. So uh, first is what are the cannabinoids? I think it's important to know that cannabis um, and cannabinoids are the compounds that have come from the cannabis plant. And uh, for the purposes of this talk, uh, when we say cannabinoids, those are the chemicals that are constituents of the cannabis plant. The most common plant that you'll hear of is cannabis sativa, but there are two other species, cannabis indica and uh, cannabis, uh, oh, it starts with an R, I always forget that one. Uh, and that one's much less common to, to, to find. In the, the cannabis plant, the active components, the two main ones that you'll see are delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or what I'll be referring to for the remainder of this talk as THC, and cannabidiol, which I'll be referring to as CBD. Those are the two main components. But in fact, there are roughly 400 or more other compounds in cannabinoids, such as cannabinol, CBN, um, terpenes, and there are um, hundreds of terpenes that may actually have their own uh, function uh, in terms of, of their activities, and then other constituents of the plant, uh, which include hydrocarbons, nitrogen compounds, amino acids, flavonoids, other vitamins, etc. And, um, and then there are, so this is a sort of organic cannabinoids, um, and then there are synthetic cannabinoids that we'll talk about. What's interesting to know is that our body, um, as well as some animals, have endocannabinoid receptors. What does that mean? It means that we have primarily these two receptors, CB1, which is the psychoactive component, and that's we have receptors there in the brain, um, in the basal ganglia. These are different portions of the brain that do different things, but as well as on in the gastrointestinal tract, in the in stomach and intestines, the reproductive system, the bone and muscle and skin. CB2 is less the psychoactive component, but these are found uh, predominantly in the immune system and may have the the anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory activity that is proposed uh, to, to happen with cannabinoid uh, stimulation. CB1 is really where you get the euphoric effects that's primary with, primarily with THC, uh, but you can have other effects like the um, appetite stimulation, um, the munchies, so to say, that you would get with uh, THC. So THC stimulates primarily CB1 um, and some CB2. CBD, uh, cannabidiol, cannabidiol, is less potent on CB1 and CB2. It may stimulate other receptors we don't know about, and it may actually result as an antagonist balancing the effects of THC. Mm -hmm. This is an area of really active, um, active uh, discussion and research. So there are synthetic and semi-synthetic cannabinoids. These are cannabinoids that are out in, um, that are going through the, that are either approved by the FDA or in the EMA in Europe. Um, the most common one that you'll hear about is dronabinol or marinol. 
And uh, this is a synthetic compound of THC. It's available by prescription in these, um, in these capsules. And it's FDA approved for uh, chemo-resistant uh, nausea vomiting. Namisol is another form of THC. It's in an oral tablet. Nabilone, otherwise known as Cezamet, is FDA approved for chemotherapy nausea vomiting that doesn't respond to conventional therapies. Nabiximols or Sativex is a cannabis extract. So this is the full cannabis extract um, that's approved in the UK that in general has a one-to-one -one combination of THC and CBD, whereas the above medications are just pure TH, synthetic THC. And then the last one was recently approved by the FDA uh, two years ago, um, Epidiolex or Cannabidiol. And this is um, an oral CBD solution, not THC, that's FDA approved for uh, severe forms of epilepsy, including children over the age of two. So where have we come from? I think you know it's important to think about the history of cannabinoid use and clinical oncology. Um, there's been a very long history of cannabinoids for medicinal use, we believe over 5,000 years. And on the right is a picture of a mummy that was found with a satchel that was believed to have um, cannabis uh, flower in it. Um, in oncology, it's really not well documented until the early 1900s, though it's likely that cancer patients have used cannabis for palliation, for pain control for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is an old Park Davis um, a glass bottle that, that um, has cannabis as a fluid extract here. In the 1950s and 1960s, the first chemotherapeutic agents were really in widespread use. And one of the issues that we had with the, with the chemotherapies that we started using for leukemia, for lymphoma, for breast cancer was that they were truly, these were quite, these were powerful compounds that caused powerful nausea and vomiting. And they're really ineffective uh, medications for nausea and vomiting at that time. Now we have a, a much larger armamentarium, although there's still those patients that really suffer um, with these side effects. And that's where we saw widespread use of cannabis um, in the supportive care of these oncology patients. Um, interestingly, you know, in the chemotherapy realm with highly nausea vomiting or what we call emetogenic compounds, um, patients were using marijuana in an illicit sense, in an illegal sense, to control both cancer pain and uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting that we, uh, we call CINV. Um, and this is something that we know, I mean, we have patients um, that to this day are, are smoking marijuana or ingesting marijuana in different ways. You know, stories that my mentors would tell me how they would send the parents or the patients to the bomb shelter or under the pier in Venice Beach to um, obtain marijuana because their nausea was so terrible. This is one of the first reports, I think, in a prominent um, uh, journal. And this is, uh, we all know, the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the uh, most prominent journals that we look for the um, highest level of, of research quality. And this is a publication from 1975 um, looking at the anti-nausea um, effect or anti-emetic effect of THC, here delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, um, in patients receiving chemotherapy. And, you know, a small study, um, you know, 20 patients that got THC versus, uh, uh, versus uh, those that got placebo. But you'll see that um, there was an effect in, in most of the patients that got THC and none of them that got the placebo. And this was reported as statistically significant. This is one of the earliest sort of higher quality research papers, although um, only uh, really 20 valuable subjects uh, were here. So in 1979, um, THC is 
being more reported again, and, and these are patients getting high-dose chemotherapy, high-dose methotrexate. Um, in 1981, the National Cancer Institute, the NCI, um, in, initiates a THC distribution program nationally. In the same year, the government sells dronabinol or Marinol uh, to the company Unimed. Unimed is now trying to get this um, FDA approved. And in 1984, the FDA, after reviewing Unimed's Marinol application for a new drug uh, application, rejects it, saying that their clinical testing was deficient. But in 1985, a year later, they re-review it and improve Marinol for nausea and vomiting associated with uh, chemotherapy. But these are patients that have already, um, that are having refractory ongoing nausea and vomiting in the setting of conventional anti-nausea medications. And interestingly, three years later in 1988, the DEA judge, Francis Young, recommends that marijuana actually be placed rescheduled. So it's, a, it's currently a Schedule I classification. It was back then. That means it's an illicit drug with a high propensity for abuse. And reschedules marijuana. He recommends it to be rescheduled to Schedule II um, for nausea associated with chemotherapy. But in fact, the DEA, the D Drug Enforcement Agency, overrules um, that judge. So it remains to this day as a Schedule I drug. Now we're going to take a fast forward and we're going to go to, to 2018 and, 2000 and, and up to now, 2020. And um, this is just a press release from the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, and looking at a study of um, medical oncologists. And these are medical oncologists um, that were polled. It was over 400 medical oncologists about their knowledge regarding marijuana use, um, what, they're, what they're basically um, discussing with patients and what the utility is. And, and what you'll see here is that, that almost 80% of medical oncologists are having a discussion with their patients about marijuana, cannabis, cannabis and cannabinoid use. I think that is really impressive um, in the current day and age that, that the majority of med medical oncologists are saying they're have a, having a discussion. And then, you know, in contrast to that, you'll look at the number of medical oncologists that feel that they're knowledgeable in cannabis, um, and that is you know, less than a third of them feel that they're, they're knowledgeable. But with this sort of uh, knowledge deficit, almost half of them are recommending uh, marijuana or cannabis use in their oncology um, uh, patient population. So I think this is a very re revealing slide um, to really show how prevalent this is in the oncology patient population. And I think if you really delve into this, looking at the patient side, most patients are wanting more knowledge and would obviously be thrilled if their physicians knew more about it. If you look at oncologists and, and what they believe in effectiveness versus pain treatments, um, you'll see that about, you know, they're split fairly evenly as a third that are equally or more effective um, to less effective that or don't know. And that two thirds actually believe um, that, that uh, cannabin cannabis and cannabinoids offer, um, an, a, offer utility as, as an addition to standard pain uh, control in, in cancer patients. Um, I think what's important is to look also at, there's a lot of buzz for cannabin cannabis and cannabinoids um, in anti-cancer therapeutics. Um, and this is a, a question that I get asked, you know, almost every week by my patients. Um, and, and what I say to them is, yes, there is preclinical evidence. And that means that there's evidence in Petri dishes and in evidence in um, animal models. And we all know that that evidence doesn't always translate to evidence um, supporting its use in human beings as an anti-cancer um, medica anti medication. 
and ways that um, cannabinoids may work. Um, we don't get, need to get into the details, but there are many cancer pathways that we target with other, uh, you know, more sophisticated medications um, that may be mediated by cannabinoids. So that being said, you know, in if we look at the preclinical models in rats, um, there have been studies showing that both cannabinol and THC can inhibit lung cancer. We know that there are CB1 and CB2 receptors in lung and breast cancer, and that's a potential target. Um, there are cannabinoids that show anti-tumor effects in, again, preclinical models of breast cancer, brain tumors as well. Um, and we do know that potentially there is possibility for enhancing um, uptake of chemotherapy into cancer cells. Again, you know, there is a signal that there may be an anti-cancer effect, but the human evidence is lacking. And I think this is an important time to, to really have caution because of the lack of clinical trial data of cannabinoids in human subjects. And so we really cannot um, recommend cannabis or cannabinoids as anti-cancer um, therapies at this time. And, and this is a oncologist, a, a, a prominent oncologist um, at UCSF, Donald Abrams, who um, is quite, quite known in the field of cannabis and oncology. And, and he says, I think, wisely, what saddens and disturbs him most is that when he sees a patient with a potentially curable malignancy who's foregoing conventional cancer therapy in hopes that cannabis oil will be a kinder, gentler treatment. The fact remains that there is no evidence at this time to support such a decision. Where there is a lot more evidence is in chemotherapy-induced nausea, vomiting, or CINV. Um, for those of you in the audience that have, that, that have cancer, that have received these types of compounds that cause um, just horrible nausea, vomiting, or have family members that have received this, you know what it's like. And that is that some of the agents that we use to try and prolong life or cure you of disease can uh, cause the worst um, side effects in terms of nausea and vomiting, um, feeling like you're on 12 foot seas um, in a small boat. And, and here we know that the um, receptors of CB1 and CB2 are actually both in the stomach and small intestine and signal vomiting centers that are in the brain and that in this way, while we have agents that do, um, that do target and block these pathways, uh, many patients continue to have severe nausea vomiting. And that's where agents like dronabinol or marinol, the synthetic THC, um, have been quite effective in patients. Um, and then nabilone and this uh, liquid formulation of dronabinol syndromes. Um, there have been several systematic randomized control trials that show improvement of chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting with synthetic cannabinoids um, so that the um, American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, and the National Comprehensive Center um, and the NCCN guidelines do recommend cannabinoids as breakthrough treatment for CINV uh, or, or chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Um, there is this phenomena called delayed chemo-induced nausea vomiting, which is particularly resistant to therapies where it's not clear um, what is really good for this, um, but cannabinoids may play a role, but that's been less studied. Um, there is questions about what's more effective, oral synthetic cannabinoids versus inhaled marijuana versus oral cannabis edibles. These are ongoing questions. And the guidelines from the American Society of Clinical Oncology um, states that the evidence really remains insufficient to recommend medical marijuana for uh, chemo-induced nausea vomiting. So 
again, there's a lot of questions here. There, there is, you know, we have FDA approved synthetic compounds for THC, but I think a lot more study needs to go into, um, you know, how, how effective these are, um, but also uh, the, you know, whether cannabis, the entire plant may be more or less effective than a synthetic pure THC. Cancer pain is a, a very important part of what we do as oncologists in trying to improve the quality of life. And I think um, it's very important to recognize that one of the reasons cancer pain is so difficult to control is it's not just one type of pain and it's not due to one thing. So there are malignancy causes that cause cancer pain that can be metastases of tumor and bone, which are particularly painful. It can be obstruction from just um, a mass. It can be from fractures of bone or bleeding into a tumor. And then there's neuropathic pain um, that can be from the cancer itself. Then the agents that we use to, um, to as anti-cancer agents also cause pain. Things like cisplatin, the platinum agents, heavy metals, um, the vinca alkaloids, things like vincristine and vinarelbine, those agents very commonly cause neuropathic type pain. And then there are all sorts of other causes of cancer pain. And we know that this, the uh, cannabis endocannabinoid receptors are quite prominent in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nerve, CB1 primarily in the central nervous system and CB2 in the peripheral nervous system. And we know that the agonist stimulants to CB1 and CB2 have, anti, have analgesic or anti-pain activity. And so, you know, this is, I think, an important um, uh, use or potential adjunct use of cannabinoids. And this is a very, very busy slide. I don't expect you to read all of it, but the point is this was, this was a meta-analysis, a group of randomized clinical trials looking at advanced cancer patients with cancer-related pain. And just to show you how all over the place they are, some showed a significant difference some showed no significant difference. Um, some showed a significant difference with different doses. Um, and again, no statistical difference. And so these are a variety of randomized trials over three decades. And I think the jury is still out. However, I do think there is a role for uh, cannabis and, can and uh, cannabinoid compounds in mitigating cancer pain. And also, um, I think an important area of, of research is actually in looking at lowering the doses of opioids and using a cannabis and cannabinoid compounds um, as an adjunct to try and reduce the opioid um, dependence on opioids for cancer pain. So another area of interest is in um, lack of appetite. Um, with cancer, both from the chemotherapies that we use and from the cancer itself, and we call this cancer-associated anorexia, different than anorexia nervosa, um, but anorexia really just means a low appetite. And so here, um, there is a lack of evidence uh, showing that um, appetite stimulation um, with cannabinoids um, has an improvement, although uh, again, anecdotally, I've seen in my patients an improvement in their, um, in their appetite. Um, you know, the randomized placebo-controlled trial, uh, the gold standard for showing a benefit of cannabis extract and dronabinol in 240 subjects um, with low appetite, did not find um, a superiority over placebo. Um, and in this study here, this was almost 500 patients, um, did not find added benefits with this synthetic THC, dronabinol. Um, however, in HIV AIDS, there was a significant increase in appetite and weight stimulation. So I think there is, again, this is an area of active um, research and one that 
Um, I think in the next few years to come, hopefully we'll have more evidence um, in terms of the use of this as a supportive care agent in cancer patients that have low appetite. And certainly, again, anecdotally for my patients, they do say that it improves the ability for them to, um, to eat and maintain weight. Again, this is um, a personal experience here. Um, and uh, I think it's important, especially in the oncology population and the pancreatic cancer population, is talking about palliation and, and the experience at the end of life. And this has been used for a couple hundred years. Um, one of the, uh, the first remarks on, on cancer, on well, cannabis at, at the end of life is from um, this Indian a physician, Sir William Brooke O'Sha O'Shaughnessy um, in Cal. He was actually English, but was in India at the time. And, and he mentions he's taking care of, rather than oncology patients, um, he's taking care of many um, tuberculosis patients at the end of life. And he says that it's evident that an advantage was, was gained from the use of this remedy, um, that patients were sort of eased into the end of life and he was able, in his words, to strew the path to the tomb with flowers and divest death of its specific uh, terrors. Um, you know, that's flowery language, but I do think that there is a, um, again, a personal, in my personal experience, an anecdotal use of cannabis in terms of improving appetite, decreasing the opioid nausea vomiting, because at this point, um, the, the, uh, many patients are on very high doses of, of um, opioid narcotics. Um, there is a sense of well-being, a potential reduction in the psychological trauma by, ex by extension of aversive memories, and, and some enhancement of sensory perception, um, which may be blunted at the end of life, things that people will be listening to music, taste, and scent. So I do think there is um, a role for cannabis at the end of life. Again, this is my personal experience um, taking care of patients in this setting. Um, but I, again, the only way to really uh, drill down on this is through in, uh, extensive clinical trials. Patients ask me regularly, well, can cannabis cause cancer? Um, and that's certainly an important, um, important uh, question. There's conflicting evidence again. Um, some of the best evidence comes from the Kaiser system where they looked at almost 65,000 patients in the uh, Northern California area, San Francisco and Oakland from age 15 to 50 um, over almost a decade. And they found that marijuana use and cancer was not associated. And this is interesting because really the majority of the patients were smoking marijuana, something that we you know, believe is not helpful to your lungs, um, but did not seem the same way that tobacco is associated with lung cancer. Um, in a systematic review of 19 clinical studies, looking at cancer risk and inhaled cannabis, um, there did not seem to be any association with either precancerous or cancerous lung lesions. So at this point, it doesn't seem like there is an increase in cancer incidence with using cannabis, but again, there are some conf conflicting reports. So I think the jury's still out. What we're not gonna get into as much here, but I think it's important to note that there is different pharmacology and pharmacokinetics. And what I mean by pharmacokinetics for this, the lay population is that different formulations of cannabis and different ways of taking it in may have a different activity. So for example, um, edibles, oral cannabis may have low and variable um, bioavailability to your body. Um, and we find that there's also a difference in the peak concentration of THC and CBD in the plasma in your blood um, when you take it orally. Um, for example, edibles and oils, and even an edible and oil will have different um, kinetics. 
uh, where, whereas it t can take hours to get to a peak concentration, and then it can last for a long time, up to 20 to 30 hours. Whereas an inhaled cannabinoid, whether you're smoking it or vaping it, um, that is rapidly absorbed in the body, and you can have peak concentrations within two to 10 minutes, but the amount in your blood will decline quite rapidly over 30 minutes to an hour. And so that I think is important in terms of what you're trying to achieve. It's also important to know that cannabinoids do interact with, with the liver enzymes that also metabolize other medi medications. And that's called the cytochrome P450 system. Why is that important? It's because so many medications that we use, use that system to, for metabolism. And so this, is a, this comes up all the time, certainly with, um, with oncologists and physicians that are skeptical um, about the safety of cannabis. And that is because cannabis is metabolized by cytochrome P450, you know, is there added toxicity with chemotherapy agents that also use that system or um, with other medications that patients might be taking? Um, so I think it's important to know that THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is an inducer of one of these enzymes. So it theoretically can do, you know, modulate the concentrations of, of common drugs like clozapine and olanzapine. Um, and CBD is also a potent blocker um, of the, or reducer of the activity of these two enzymes, CYP3A4 and CYP2D6. Um, which is important because it might then increase the concentration of medications that use that, that system to metabolize them. So, you know, what I'm saying to, to, to distill this, what the conclusion is, is that, you know, theoretically there can be um, a, a chemotherapy, changes with chemotherapy concentrations. That's something that is important to note. But so far, clinical evidence has not really shown too much effect on the pharmacokinetics of drugs like arenatica and docetaxel with cannabis. And there are other studies that are coming forward showing similar things. So while we believe it is safe with chemotherapy, we don't know the answer. And again, you know, I can't say this enough, we need clinical trials to assess the interactions uh, with chemotherapy. So where do we go from here? I think I've painted a picture thus far that says we have a lot of questions to answer in cannabis and clinical oncology, um, both in its therapeutic activity in cancer, um, as well as the safety given as an adjunct and as its and in activity in terms of uh, improving nausea vomiting, pain control, and uh, anorexia or, uh, or low appetite. These are a variety of trials that are going on. Um, one of the things that's really limiting current active trials in oncology is that cannabin cannabis and cannabinoids are still, continue still considered to be Schedule I um, class drugs, uh, which requires a whole different level of um, of observation and uh, not just red tape, but, but really safety concerns. Um, and so it does really limit the, um, the ability to study um, cannabis and cannabinoid compounds um, in oncology because of the classification. Um, I'm going to conclude here um, just by saying, just summarizing, we've had a long history of using cannabis in, in oncology. Um, I believe the greatest application is, you know, in, in this realm is for supportive care and symptom management in our patients, um, both for acute management of uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting, as well as long-term management of cancer pain, um, well-being, and potentially at the end of life. Um, I do think that there is preclinical data that supports 
the potential anti-cancer uh, uh, anti-cancer um, activity of cannabinoids, but so far the evidence is truly lacking to be able to say um, that this should be used along with conventional treatments um, as an anti-cancer uh, drug. Um, I think cannabinoid use in, in patients uh, undergoing chemotherapy appears to be safe. It doesn't appear to interact in a significant way, but we need um, clinical trials to, to show that. And the only way that we are really going to be able to justify um, all of these things that we've said is by doing large prospective clinical trials in adults and children. Um, and I think that this is really a calling to be doing those sorts of trials um, because without it, we will be talking anecdotes and um, not really dealing in, in real evidence. So um, with that, I am going to um, open it up to uh, questions. And um, I, uh, all right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fetterman, thank you so much. You absolutely answered the question, what do we know? And of course, as you said in the beginning, uh, there'll be more questions and answers potentially. So um, I know I have some pre-questions from people, but um, I'd love to, love to hear if any of you or participants today um, have questions, either raise your hand or unmute your audio or share in the chat room. Uh, may I start with the, my first question is, is NIH funding clinical trials or are they uh, resisting because it's a class one drug and not a cl class two drug? I mean, to me, um, I think I think to start clinical trials would be a go with all patients. So is this a political problem? Is, is it because NIH is not funding? Uh, well, stay out of the politics because I uh, this is not the place to be right now. But um, the there is, I think, a groundswell of support for um, not just NIH support but also foundation support. And again, even with that type of support, the um, the ability to do this type of research when it's a schedule drug, schedule one drug, does really limit. The um, you know as an investigator, you need to have a Schedule One license, and um, having tried to get one this past year, it is no joke. Um, the amount of digging the FBI and the DEA needs to do into your past um, it's it's incredible. So I think there there are limitations both on the institution and what the institution is willing to do. Um, you know, I, even at a place like UCLA, where I really think we're quite progressive um, and have a cannabis research initiative, there is, um, there are a lot of roadblocks in terms of being able to do a prospective cannabis trial where you're actually using cannabis in patients in a, in a um, therapeutic way. So a lot of the trials now have been more observational trials. That is, for example, a patient, an oncology patient who's undergoing chemotherapy that is taking cannabis on their own. And um, the benefit of that trial is that you, that type of trials, you don't need to have a schedule one classification. They're obtaining the, the cannabis on their own. The downside to that is trying to maintain a, um, a cannabis, cannabis formulation that's the same every time. And so um, again, the, you know, I think in a few years, I'm hoping we'll be in a different place. Uh, you know, I would like to see cannabis move from a schedule one to a schedule two drug because that will really open up the ability to do uh, research in, an, in a more easier way. Thank you, Aggie. Thank you. Um, anybody else? I see a, com a, a question here uh, from uh, Venus Bina. Um, oh, sorry, this is private chat. Sorry about that. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Fetterman, we had uh, someone write in. Uh, could you comment on the effects of Rick Simpson oil? Uh, is there any effectiveness or detrimental effects in consuming the substance for cancer therapy? Uh, so, um, I, I, you know, there are so many different formulations of cannabis compounds that are on the market. And it would really, I don't know them all. Um, Rick Simpson oil, which is a cannabis compound that's particularly rich in THC. Um, you know, again, I think something that's important to keep in mind when you are consuming these is the, is the percent of THC and CBD. Those are the two uh, highest, the two richest compounds in cannabis. THC, again, is the psychoactive component to this and CBD has a less psychoactive component it may have more of an anti-inflammatory component it may modulate some of the psychoactive effects of THC but you do have to be careful when you're consuming something with a lot of THC that there are toxicities associated with it and periodically we will have patients that have um, horrible anxiety um, that you know, we talk about the bad trip and that's, you know, oftentimes just um, really the feeling of a panic attack that you can get from um, high concentrations of THC. You can have heart palpitations. And I've had patients end up in emergency rooms um, with, with, these, with these sorts of um, side effects. So it's something to be careful about with any of these medications. They are um, substances that that can have detrimental effects. I have a question. Yes. Yes. If so, if a patient, if, if a cancer patient comes to you, and they want to <clears throat> try cannabis, you are able to help to put them on a schedule, or how does that work? Because uh, you know, I I am taking stuff, but I'm not sure if I'm doing the right combination for what I have. Because you know, I have different things. I never had chemo, but I had a I had breast cancer and radiation, and you know, I already had uh, uh, chronic pain issues, and now I'm taking AIs, and the pain my pain levels have really raised, and I'm in pain constantly. So, so that's why I started that. So if I come to you, will you be able to put me on a schedule? No for a variety of reasons. Um, and, and so I think that's very important. Um, you know, while this is something that I deal with on a, on a regular base, basis with my oncology patients, I also have restrictions that the university and our medical system places on me. And, um, and what I do tell patients is that, that I'm willing to work together with them and an outside um, physician or specialist. These can be nurse practitioners, they can be MDs that really do focus on the care of patients that are taking cannabis and cannabinoid compounds. Um, and I think that's very important is to have your oncologist or your primary care physician or subspecialist partner with um, a uh, specialist in the community um, to help in your care. And that, that also helps alleviate, you know, helps me focus on the, on the cancer patient um, and on targeting the cancer and making sure that I'm dealing, I'm doing all the appropriate things with chemotherapy. In the end, I'm still a subspecialist, but I do think it is important to involve um, specialists, and there are many in the community. It's an expanding field. Um, you know, periodically I'm asked if this is something that I'd like to do for a living, and the reality is that um, I can only do so much, and, you know, I'm still an oncologist. So it's a very good question, um, Venus, in terms of, you know, what I do I do? I didn't get my answer. So if I have my primary physician, okay. I mean, they, they know what's going on and they know right. I'm taking care. But right. My response is that, that I would have your primary physician or you can reach out to a cannabis specialist in your community okay. and work with your 
you know, to the extent that your primary physician is willing to work with them on a regimen that they believe is good for you. And what I say to patients um, as we work together um, is, you know, let's start at a very low dose and slowly, very, it's a low and slow approach. You start at a low dose and you very slowly titrate upwards. And, um, you know, and that's, that is, and there's, you know, you have to balance what is the ratio of CBD to THC. Yeah, but that's what I don't know what I'm supposed to, to take. Right. You know, I started THC like five milligram in the, and I have severe insomnia. Right. So it was helping in the beginning. Now it seems my body has got used to that five milligram, but I don't know. I should, I just keep raising it. Um, that's so that where I'm not going to give you medical recommendations okay. on here, but I do think it's important rather than to do this in a vacuum um, you know, some of this is on your own trial and error is to try and find someone in the community that okay. does this for a living and specializes and yeah, helps I, you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Venus, let me, let me, let me add that if, uh, if you uh, contact Amy, she'll give you um, local doctors that specialize in those. Oh, fantastic. Okay, Amy, thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Can I have your uh, email? Can you put the, your email in the chat or? I, just I will, it? yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, we had another question about um, the use of suppositories. Um, so, you, you know, we didn't talk about all the different routes that you can take um, cannabinoids. Uh, sorry, there's a I'm on campus here at UCLA. I'm one of the few people that's allowed back on campus, but there's ambulances passing by. So the different routes of cannabis, of, of taking cannabis, and, um, and there are many. Um, there are probably up to 20 um, ways of ingesting cannabis. Um, the most common are smoking, which I generally do not recommend, vaping, uh, which is similar to smoking, but it's not smoking. You're, you're using some heat source um, to vaporize, um, to get the oils, uh, the cannabinoid oils volatile, and then you're inhaling them. Um, cannabis oils or tinctures that you use a dropper and you put in your mouth. Uh, cannabis edibles, so, uh, you know, this is candy bars, whatever, brownies, whatever it is. Um, and then there are different ways of smoking that I don't recommend. There are different vaping techniques, like putting a vaporizer in your home, like the things you get at Target and putting the, the oils in there. I don't recommend that either. Um, and then there are way, then there are other ways, which is, um, suppository. So going per rectum, um, and generally I don't recommend that unless you can't um, take anything by mouth, and that is not uncommon in a patient with um, esophageal cancer um, where, you know, they may not be able to swallow, and so that is a route. Um, there is topical, so putting uh, cannabis patches or creams, salves on your skin, but usually you don't get a, a large amount of cannabis in that way. Um, so, you know, my recommendation is uh, if that's the um, route that is, um, you know, is the only available route, I think it's fine. In general, I say don't be using anything uh, per rectum in a suppository when you're undergoing chemotherapy and have um, chemotherapy neutropenia, so you have a low white count, because um, you can induce, you can uh, cause infection that way. Other questions? If there are not, then then uh, let me close by thank, thanking Dr. Fetterman for really an intense <laughs> hour of, of learning. And we know that there's so much more to do. I, I want to thank all the all of you. I see your names. I don't see photos. I see some from, many friends from the foundation. And I thank you for being with us. And Dr. Fredman, I know your time is 
very valuable and uh, we thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate your um, listening in on here. I will say that, you know, I did not dumb this down to anybody. Um, I really tried to maintain the um, level of evidence, the talk that I would give to physicians, but try to explain it more towards all of you. I hope it wasn't over your heads. But um, anyway, thank you. Um, thank and, you so much. Great lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fetterman. Really appreciate Bye. your time. Have okay. a good Stay weekend. Stay safe, everybody, please. And, um, and hopefully in six months, we'll be able to go outside again. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.